All right. Uh, don't forget these uh, shirts. I'll, I'll, I'll fill them out here a little more accessible. And we'll get right through and hopefully find one your size. For those of you that would like to do that. All right. Third letter in Revelation to the church at Pergamon. Pergamon. I think I've seen it spelled different ways. Pergamon. Oh, it's Pergamon's. Well, my Bible says P E R G A M U N. But I've also seen it as M O N. But anyway. So, as usual, we'll talk a little bit about uh, the city. It is a uh, city that still exists to some degree. It was not a coastal city as the previous two, uh, but it was a city of great commerce and prominence uh, despite its location away from um, the sea. The primary uh, characteristic of the city of Pergamum is that uh, it exists almost in two separate geographical areas. There was a lower part of the city where the actual church probably was, and then there was this huge, uh, almost sheer mound where you had to have a winding road to go up it. I don't know if you've ever done that on a mountain where you've had one of these corkscrew roads. Um, the, the one that comes to mind is the volcano in Capulin, uh, where you start at the bottom and go up. Unless you're up there, and then you go down. Um, so that's... And up there were the landmarks of the city, which included three big temples, uh, one to Athena, one to Dionysius, and one to Zeus, which is the primary one we'll talk about. And then there was one temple to uh, the emperor, the Roman emperor. This was a Roman city. Uh, it had been in Rome's possession for a long time. It was actually given to Rome in the will of the previous king um, a couple hundred years uh, B.C. I don't remember the dates, not really all that relevant. Uh, so this was this was looking over uh, the lower part of the city. It was also known for a couple of things. It had the second largest library, a collection of nearly a quarter million uh, books, which of course were written on parchment. And in fact, it is thought that the word Pergamum uh, is is either from parchment or evolved into parchment because the, um, the, the move from animal skins to parchment apparently was part of the library there. There was one bigger library, which is one of the seven wonders of the world, and that was the Library of Alexandria. So this was a big place of religion and a big place of intellect. The other thing that was very significant about the city is that it was a place of healing and a prominent uh, healing god uh, and a prominent healer was there. And you all have seen the, the EMS symbol or the medical symbol, the caduceus with the snakes. Um, that probably comes from here because snakes were part of the healing process. One commentator said that uh, one of the ways that people who would come from all over to be healed there uh, was partly because of some springs, and we know what that's like. There's a number of hot springs that have supposedly have healing powers. We're going to be in uh, Glenwood Springs here in a couple of weeks, and uh, we'll be floating around in that hot springs with a lot of other sick people hoping to be healed. (laughs) 
So, um, but but one of the one of the ceremonies there apparently was that there were serpents who were let loose and slithering around on in uh, one of these edifices for healing, and you would lay down and let. The snakes be around you, yeah. and so anyway, there was this, um, you know. And you think about that. Have you heard the the, you know, the little fish you put your feet in and they, yeah. you take care of the dead skin, and yeah. and now we're back to using leeches for you know for some mm-hmm. medical purposes. So uh, maybe it's not as bizarre as it sounds, but it does sound bizarre. But anyway, the next time you see the medical symbol, you can think about that uh, satanic ancient. Uh, Practice. <laughs> but it's also from Moses. Well, let me let me. Uh, that's true. Um, but I will also say that um, everything the devil does is a counterfeit of what the Lord has done. There you go. And so if he's 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 a liar and he's deceptive. But he's not really very creative. Right. Because all he really wants to do is to take everything that God has designed and make it his own and take glory away from God. So he's the great counterfeiter. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, we see in celebrations, we, we think about Jesus as the, the sheep. And what's the satanic symbol? Mm-hmm. The goat. <coughs> With the pentagram, the goat's horns. Mm-hmm. Uh, we think of the cross. And uh, in some Satan worship, it's the upside down cross. And so he wants to do everything that's an, it's a mimicry or a mockery. Uh, so, yeah, there is a connection there. Probably. But it was a, a, a supernatural spiritual experience, as well as the healing arts that they had, whether it be herbs or... or uh, or whatever. So, uh, the biggest monument that was way up on the hill was a large U shape. And when I say large, just just huge. Um, I don't I don't know if you if you think about some of the biggest buildings that you've ever been around. How many of you have been to Washington D.C.? Just big, 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 big buildings. You know, the Smithsonian and the Capitol building. Um, the Temple of Zeus was just huge. And I, I could give you the dimensions from history, and it, it, it would just be hard to imagine. But if you can imagine um, a big U shape, almost like a chair with armrests, and within that edifice was. Um, the throne of Zeus. And since Zeus was worshipped as a god, but he was not the one true god, who was that really? That was Satan's throne. That was Satan's throne. Um, Interestingly, that was the, the physical throne was moved in the early 1900s to Berlin for a museum. And um, it's questionable whether Hitler sat there or not, but it's a little spooky to think about this satanic monument being moved to Berlin before Hitler's power took place. Interesting, interesting. So let's take a look at the text here. Write to the angel of the church in Pergamum. Thus says the one who has the sharp, double-edged sword. Let's think about that a little bit. I have two illustrations. Um, I remember a time, it was a very frightening time, where um, Cheryl was uh, actually restrained and laid out on a table by a number of masked people. I was not allowed to intervene. One of them took a knife and, and cut her. Uh, and uh, our baby was born <laughs> as a result of that. So um, I sometimes use that as an illustration of the way the media portrays police activity. <laughs> <laughs> Terrible thing. Um, 
But the point is that a uh, an instrument like a sword or a knife or a blade or an edged uh, utility can do good and it can do damage. Right? Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that that one commentator um, and you know you, you don't get a single picture of everything from any single commentator, um, but but one in particular. It, you know, whatever kind of makes sense and, and isn't contradicted in scripture, I'll uh, grab onto. We tend to think of uh, this symbolic sword, uh, two-edged sword, coming out of the mouth of Jesus as the typical sword that we think about in pirate movies or Roman gladiators. But another type of sword that was used in uh, Roman military battles was a double-sided, large, actually shovel-shaped, or if you want to go this route, tongue-shaped um, device with a handle and uh, like a T-bar at the top. Mm -hmm. And it was very heavy. And rather than the thrusting for individual combat, it was wielded this way where it would slice back and forth, and who would want to approach that weapon? That could take care of a whole crowd of people and keep people's distance and <laughs> slice them uh, quite efficiently with that kind of weapon. So if you want to think about uh, this two-edged sword as that um, uh, level of lethality or effectiveness, it's an interesting visual. I know where you live, where Satan's throne is. Yet you were holding on to my name and did not deny your faith in me. And so, again, Satan's throne is interpreted in a lot of different ways, but most uh, theologians and Bible students and uh, archaeologists, historians, uh, believe that they're talking about Satan's physical residence. One of the things that we perhaps do that is not theologically sound is attribute uh, more power to Satan than we ought. Mm -hmm. Now, we don't want to underestimate satanic influence. Uh, we don't want to underestimate the spiritual battles that take place uh, in the heavenlies and on our planet and in our individual lives. But Satan does not have the characteristics of God, so he is not omnipresent. He goes about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour, right? Mm -hmm. So he doesn't always know everything that we're up to. And so the implication is that maybe he does have a place that he hangs out. And maybe this was his earthly residence in some spiritual, unfathomable way. Now, we talked about some statistics last week about our community and uh, what kind of environment that we lived in, the live in. And one of the things that Cheryl and I have learned over the years of our marriage is that place makes a difference. And I believe that sometimes we think the grass is greener on the other side of the fence, and it's not really, it's just our perspective. I believe in the concept of blooming where you're planted, um, but I also know that place makes a difference. And so the uniqueness of Colorado and Southern Colorado and Huerfano County and Walsenburg in particular um, has a significance in the way that we live and the way that we minister and the way that we reach out. And uh, I'm not going to claim that this has any more uh, spiritual, satanic influence than any other place, um, but we do need to recognize that there are spiritual battles that happen here. Um, and some of the negative aspects, and by the way, we love living here. We're very fortunate uh, that we've ended up here. We did not intend to retire here. I didn't intend to retire. I thought I would just die. <laughs> and so we're, we're, we're at a place, and I've told you the story about our house. We prayed fervently for 20 years that it would be sold and no answer to that prayer, and then it was there for us when we needed it. So we're, we know that we are here for um, 
a purpose. But it is a unique place. One of the things that I like to ask people who weren't born here is the question, how did you end up in Walsenburg? <laughs> and it almost always starts out, well, you know, it's a funny story. <laughs> um, so place does make a difference. And uh, the Lord knows that. And he knew about Pergamum. Yet you were holding on to my name and did not deny your faith in me, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was put to death among you where Satan lives. Remember, since there was a temple there and it was Roman and there was uh, emperor worship, that at least on one day a year, everybody in the region had to say, Caesar is Lord. And the Christians would not do this. They would only say, Jesus is Lord. Now, there is something about the name Jesus that causes um, consternation among people. So we call him Lord, true. We call him Christ or the Christ, true. Um, we call him a lot of different things. The Bible has three over 300 uh, appellations or, or ways to refer to Christ, the Son of Man, the Son of God. Um, but, but the name Jesus really causes people some grief. And so when they would not stand up and say Caesar is Lord, because they must only confess that Jesus is Lord, they were subject to the death penalty for being a traitor. And... Um, we can imagine a scenario, again, this is conjecture, just kind of put it in my head, where the people of the church are lined up in front of an official. Antipas happens to be the first one in line or the most prominent person, maybe a pastor, maybe just happens to be in the... And, and the, the, the official points and says, you need to say the emperor is Lord, Caesar is Lord. Not going to do it. Jesus is Lord. And so he's executed yep. for that in the presence of the others. Now, we don't know that any others were martyred on that day. It may be that, may be that the official says, you know, you go think about this. We'll be back next year. But they remained faithful. The church remained faithful um, even in the light of that execution. Antipas, um, if you look at the word origin of that, it means against everybody. And so perhaps Antipas was a person who was against everything from the world and for the Lordship of Jesus. Even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was put to death among you, where Satan will live, second time there's a reference to Satan's residence. And isn't it interesting that Jesus knew about Antipas? Now, I don't know how many millions of people were on the planet. I don't know how many martyrs had already died. Uh, martyr, by the way, just started out as the word witness. If you look at the word or origins of that, the word martyr was just witness, like a witness in court. But the martyrdom of the early witnesses was so profound that the definition of the word changed to mean someone who suffers for their faith. My faithful witness who was put to death among you. But Jesus knew him. And we're going to talk about a little bit of intimacy about Jesus knowing us here as we move through this relatively brief letter. But I have a few things against you. Have you in this study thought about what Jesus would say if he visited us? And he says... Hey, New Hope Community Church of Walsenburg, I know you. I know your deeds. I know where you live. Here's a commendation for you. There's, these are things that I like. And you wait because you've been through the Seven Churches Sermon Series. And we say, we know there's a commendation, but there's always a warning or a condemnation. Where would we be in it? I, I don't really, I know. I, I know what, I, I'm confident that he would commend us for a number of things. Um, but we need to be cautious and perhaps, 
perhaps certainly the modern day church, whether we're guilty or not, is certainly a, this message is a message for the day. I have a few things against you. You have some, some there who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to place a stumbling block in front of the Israelites to eat meat, sacrifice to idols, and to commit sexual immorality. In the same way, you also have those who, soul, who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. So repent. All right, we're going to do a little background here. Do y'all remember that story? You remember the donkey that talked in the Old Testament? That's this story. So there was a king of Moab, and remember talking about the Moabites on and off through First and Second Samuel. Um, and the the Moabites were the one, among the first people threatened by the crossing of the Israelites from from uh, uh, crossing the Jordan River into the Promised Land. And they had heard, probably just from a couple of years ago, that uh, what had happened to the Egyptian army who had pursued the Israelites as they left out of their slavery. Uh, so he knew this story. And so the king hired a soothsayer, a prophet, not necessarily a prophet of God, capital G, but somebody who was well known as a diviner and said, uh, I'm going to hire you to put a curse on Israel because I know they have the capacity to overtake us and to push our boundaries. And so we don't want that to happen. So they hired this guy. Um, and I always confuse who was the king and who was the prophet, but I think uh, uh, so. I'd have to look back and find out. But um, so this so this prophet who was going to be paid good money to put a curse on Israel recognizes that God is God, even though he's not necessarily a prophet of God. Mm -hmm. And he tries to put a curse on Israel because that's what he's being paid to do, but he just can't do it. And every time he tries to say a curse on Israel, it comes out as a blessing. <laughs> the king says, stop that. That's not what I'm paying you for. <laughs> okay, let me, let, 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 let's go through a little rigmarole. It's kind of an interesting story. But uh, So the second time that he tries to pronounce a curse on Israel, he pronounces another blessing. And the third time, he tries to curse Israel, and he pronounces another blessing. And so he realizes that he's not going to get at Israel that way. So what he advises the king to do is to send a bunch of pagan women into the community and let the women corrupt Israel. And guess what? That worked. And the women brought their... Um, their false gods and their traditions and their licentiousness. Now, this was from a certain culture. I'm not painting a broad picture on the evilness of women. <laughs> and so Israel began to do two things. We talked about the word Cheryl's big on vocabulary. She's been studying vocabulary to keep her mind sharp. Not working. And. Uh, <laughs> You know, I was not going to go there. <laughs> um, and uh, so the word bifurcation came up in a commercial the other day. So if you're going to be on one path, you're going to be on one path. If that path splits, can you, you can walk on both paths for a little while, but eventually you've got to choose one or the other or make your own third, right? So this began to be a bifurcated path for the... Israelites and they began to do all of their proper worship but added to that the immorality and the Baal worship and the idol worship of these interlopers sent in by this devious Moabite king. And so that's, that's the story that Jesus is saying 
That's what's happening to you guys. You guys are not staying on the path of righteousness and true worship. One of the books that we don't study a lot, and even when we're doing our annual Read the Bible Through program, Leviticus, 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 Leviticus. <laughs> but we need to understand that the people of God came out of years of slavery and years of exposure to Egyptian culture. And so their idea of what it meant to worship the deity was spoiled by their surroundings. And God had to tell them there is one true God and we can't have idolatry. And this is the way that you stay on the righteous path of honoring the one true God. It gave all of these regulations so that the Israelites would be very, very different than their pagan, polytheistic, uh, sensuous surroundings. We are to be a peculiar people. This was a problem with the Israelites from the very beginning. It was a problem in the Old Testament multiple times, we see it. And now it began to be a problem in the early church in the city of Pergamum. Surrounded, literally overwhelmed, overseen by paganism. I don't know how many of you read the paper, and if you do, I don't know if you read the editorial. Ken Sadek writes uh, for the paper every week. I've uh, met Ken um, He's a musician, been around a little bit, interesting guy, uh, says some interesting things. But I'll quote a little bit from his column. Conventional wisdom advises against discussing politics or religion in family and social gatherings. Both topics trigger primal reactions and opinions on either are vehemently held. That's no coincidence when our origin is how we should live our lives and who has the authority to control our behavior where we should go from here and who shall lead us there are all puzzles that span the bridge connecting the two topics. The sources for true knowledge of both politics and religion are less than dependable. This is a very humanistic view. Um, and it's interesting that when somebody, say, and I'm not piling on Ken here, I'd be happy to converse with him about it, and I'm biting my tongue not to send in a <laughs> rebuttal. Um, I, I've offered, I've authored several letters to the editor for different newspapers around the country, actually, and the pile of things that I had the good sense not to send <laughs> is bigger. Sure. Um, but think about the, just think about the logic of the statement. The sources for true knowledge of both politics and religion are less than dependable. Who said that? Is he speaking what he thinks is a truth? Then by his own indictment in one sentence, isn't he saying that the truth that he speaks is not dependable? See, that's the, that's the, that's the circle that we get into when we don't say, this is the foundation, this is truth with a capital T, this is trustworthy, this is the, these are the rules, these are God's intent. Um, we have to say that. I've, I've been taking an on online course about the dependability of Bible, and, and one of the things that came up in the discussion among this uh, panel of uh, theologians is, um, well, people say, you know, one of the biggest sources of validation of Scripture is Scripture. So it's internally validated. And people say, well, that's a tautology. That's circular reasoning. You can't say that something validates itself. And one of the commentators, one of the panelists said, we're, we're okay with that. There are a lot of things that validate itself. Yeah. Right? So so that's not, that's not a really great argument for those of you that are into uh, apologetics. Um, we hold our scriptural texts in sacred esteem and every religion and sect claims that theirs were bestowed by their respective God, ignoring the historical fact that they were written by men over centuries and continued to morph to adapt to the political winds of the day. I can only describe that in words that are not appropriate for the pulpit on Sunday morning. <laughs> this is the world's view of this sacred book this miraculously preserved 
God-written, remarkably consistent, life-changing book written by men to conform to political whims. That's the, that is the attitude of the world. Right? So we also know from surveys that a lot of people who are church-going identify themselves as Christians, even evangelical Christians, will not believe in the inerrancy of Scripture. And when we talk about inerrancy, we're talking about the truth of the gospel. There are little grammatical things and punctuation things and translation questions, but there's none of that that is so significant that it alters the message of Scripture. Yeah, that's right. And that's validated uh, in all kinds of ways. This book is validated by history, even when for years and decades and centuries it was assailed as being historically incorrect. Every time they dig something up, they thought, oh, well, I guess the Bible was right after all. I guess this king did exist. I guess this city did exist. I guess this earthquake did happen. I guess this flood did happen. It is getting more and more validated every year, historically, archaeologically, geologically, and just in our own life experience. So to say that we're ignoring the historical fact that the this text was written by men over centuries. Well, it was written by men over centuries. Mm -hmm. Dozens of authors over dozens of time periods, and they have one singular message from Genesis 1-1 to Revelation, Revelation 22. Um, as literal or recorded history, they utterly lack credibility. I'm sorry, that is a statement of unbelievable ignorance about the veracity and historicity of Scripture. You find me any ancient text that has as many ancient manuscripts that are as consistent, and when they found those Dead Sea Scrolls and found out that the translations had been so remarkably consistent over the years... It's not like the old game we used to play, telephone, yeah. where you start over here and you end up with a whole different message. We know how communication gets messed up. So it is miraculous that this Bible is so consistent with its historical manuscripts and the number of them. Now, do we know whether a guy named Shakespeare existed or a guy named uh, Abraham Lincoln existed or a guy named Julius Caesar existed or a guy named uh, just any uh, Homer or uh, any ancient writer or character only from the written record and we believe that without question but the number of manuscripts and historical cross validation is much less than the story of the Israelite people and the story of Christ. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right? we, this is a very dependable book. You don't have to be a believer to understand the science of knowing the reliability of this particular manuscript in the study of ancient manuscripts. Yeah. All right? mm -hmm. I, know, I know I don't have to convince you, but, but as many people have read this, and will like, yeah, you're right, Ken. No, you're wrong, Ken. Mm -hmm. For those who choose not to embrace a religious credo, you're going to serve somebody. I know that's a song and not a verse, but it actually is scriptural. But who instead rely on belief in the intrinsic goodness of human beings. <laughs> you know, we've had a few thousand years at least to evolve into perfection. Ain't happening. And maybe I've looked at the dark side of humanity for too long. Maybe my uh, perspective is skewed. But uh, that, you know, if you believe that, bless your heart. <laughs> Secular humanists are capable of exercising the same moral behavior which religious tenets encourage. Now, I do believe that by God's grace, you can have a... Um, a, a, a relatively moral person who's an unbeliever, mm -hmm. and you know sometimes the test is well. Let's take this person that thinks that they're that says they're a Christian, and this person that says that they're not, and look at their lives. And the Christian's life is more messed up and wicked than the 
than the other. That's not, that's not the tenet of our religion that he's assuming here. Because we rely on the righteousness of the Savior. Our impassioned attachment to religious and political notions is evidence of our fear. Well, maybe. Fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Mm -hmm. I like the little bumper sticker that says, when everyone around you is panicking and you are not, you probably don't know what's going on. <laughs> Most of our founding fathers were deists, but none were crusading Christians. I tell you what, the, the people on the religious right want to talk about how religious our founders were. The people on the left say, oh no, they weren't religious at all. That Some of them were deists. Well, it's somewhere in the middle, but there were very dedicated Christian men involved in the founding of this nation. And the fact that we have a First Amendment that says, that talks about freedom of religion, not freedom from, but freedom of religion, is a product of those who feared religious interference in government, but it's also a product of those who feared government influence in religion. Mm -hmm. And if we've seen any evidence of that in America, it's a, it's a contest that continues uh, in recent days. None of us really knows squat is his conclusion. And to allow unbridled fervency to govern the practical operation of the just society would be foolish and approach doomed to fail yet again. Baklev Havel, the enlightened writer, poet and first president of the New Czech Republic says, quote, keep the company of those who seek the truth and run from those who have found it. And the final words of the article are, he's a smart guy. Mm -hmm. Let me talk about the logical fallacy of this. Run from those who have found truth. Are you trying to speak a truth about truth? Then we should run from you. Mm -hmm. So when people say there's no, there are no absolutes, is that not an absolute? <laughs> yes. I think about the, the, the controversy about the gender identity and, and uh, um, people say, um, I'm non-binary. All right? I, so does, does that mean that everybody that's non-binary is binary? Isn't that a binary system? I'm caught up in the illogical nature of that. And I, I, I'm not without compassion for folks that um, are dealing with that. But you see, this kind of enlightened secular humanist attitude, it's not overtly satanic, but it is something that has been embraced by the modern church because we don't know anything about suffering. We don't want to suffer. We don't want to exclude everybody. We want to open up to everybody, right? And as I said before, if you want to walk in that door and sit here and observe us and worship with us and discuss with us, that's wonderful. You're not going to be a member automatically just because we are afraid of excluding somebody because we don't want you determining what our finances uh, are, are paid for and, and uh, who gets to teach what in our services. We have to maintain some uh, consistency with this and not with the world. Mm -hmm. One of the most tragic perversions, I think, of American Christianity was the uh, ill-fated, seeker-friendly approach. I think we should have a seeker-friendly approach, right? I think we ought to be ready to, uh, it, to, to help people understand what we believe and why we believe it. I think we need to be open to anybody that walks in. I think we need to love them as Jesus loved them. I think we need to look at, at everybody through the eyes of Christ who died for that person. All right? So don't misunderstand me. But there has been a line that's been crossed in many churches where they're not just seeker-friendly, they're sinner-friendly. Mm -hmm. Or even sin-friendly. We cannot embrace the values of the world whether they be political or moral or spiritual, and maintain our one allegiance to Christ because the world's way is incompatible with Jesus' way. 
All right? Am I, am I being too dogmatic about that? Am I being too exclusive? Am I offending anybody? We will offend. Jesus is offensive. When we say, you are a sinner, you need to be saved, you need to give your heart to Jesus, that's offensive to someone who does not want to change, who believes that they are content and righteous in themselves. It is a rock of offense. Because Jesus is the cornerstone that's rejected by the builders of this world. So, let's listen here as I close. Let anyone who has ears to hear, that's us, listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give him the hidden manna. I will also give him a white stone, and on the stone a new name is inscribed that no one knows except those who receive. Now, dozens and dozens of different interpretations. Remember the manna? Yeah. It was dropped from heaven. It was sustenance. It was assurance. It was plenty. It was uh, pleasant, although they got sick of it. And it was preserved. Some of it was preserved in the Ark of the Covenant mm-hmm. as a reminder of the people of God's provision. So Jesus is referring to that man. Maybe he's even referring to the day that that ark will be discovered and opened in front of us. Or maybe since we don't need to have any symbols anymore when we get in the presence of God, that that sustaining manna is entirely symbolic because Jesus is the bread of life, right? The white stone, uh, typically in the ancient world, white stones were a ticket to admission. You were given a white stone if you were a, a, a prevailing athlete in a contest, uh, and that got you up to the podium for the award. Or, or uh, there was another uh, example, because we don't really know, but there was another example. Uh, one of the commentators that I listened to, one of the preachers that I listened to, said that there was a custom in the day where um, if you were sweet on somebody and you had this little sweet pet name, you'd write that on a white stone and you'd kind of give that as a, as a token of your affection, right? When I was a young police officer, I was being trained by uh, uh, another uh, cop, and um, he, he, uh, I really appreciated the time and devotion he gave to me. And his, his, he and his wife were you know, very nurturing, and so I would often go over to their, um, you know, when it was break time, we'd, we'd often go to their house and, and eat. Now, when I was FTO, I would drop somebody off and then I'd go home and eat. But these were very hospitable people. <laughs> and in their cute little intimate way, as they were leaving each other, they'd say, you're a butt, no, you're a butt. <laughs> and I was like, what? I don't need to hear this. <laughs> That's cute, you know. So do you have a little pet name that, that, that nobody outside your little family knows? All right. Uh, I don't want to hear it. <laughs> so this illustration was Jesus loves you in a really personal way and he's got a name for you perhaps the one that was written in the book of life and uh, you don't know what that name is but it's just for you it's just for you I went most of my life without meeting another Joel and then in one college class there were three of us um, and if you Google Joel Schultz, there's lots of Joel Schultzes out there. I don't know what they're up to. I don't know why they have my name, but they're out there. <laughs> but there's a name that I'm going to get that nobody else has. That's just special, just between me and Jesus. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now let me back up a little bit. And Jesus says in verse 16, So repent, otherwise I'll come to you quickly and fight against them with the sword of my mouth. So the people within this good church, there were some who were very, very compromised with the world and still pretending to be a dedicated Christ follower. And they were on a bifurcated bifurcated path. And Jesus says, you church, you take care of that problem or I will. Don't make me pull over. <laughs> And I'll do it very severely. So as a protection 
I would ask that we, together as a church, repent and confess of any possible, even if we can't identify it, even if we don't know, let's just confess, Lord, we don't want to do anything that does not glorify you. We don't want to be so concerned about getting people into the church that we compromise our message, forget our first love, and avoid any persecution. Those are the lessons from the first three churches so far, right? Uh, We may be treading a very difficult path, and we may not be sitting under the shadow and the throne of Satan, but if you think Satan is not alive and well and working in our community, you are deluded because he's here. And the more we do, as he patrols, he'll eventually find out about it, and he'll be mad, and he will attack. Do you understand that warning? Do you understand the reality of that? Do you understand what that might look like? That might look like political opposition. It might look like the physical breakdown of health of your pastor or the, the, the membership. It may look like an attack against the building. It might be crime and vandalism and, and fire. We, we don't know what the devil has in mind for us when he finds out that we are glorifying Christ, which makes him unbelievably angry. And we need to be ready to remember where's our first love, what's our first priority, and are we ready to suffer a little bit? Let's close in prayer.